Joining us now, Ruben Gastambide Fernandez, who's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and the principal investigator of a study called Proyecto Latino. And it's good to have you here. Buenas noches. It's good to be here. Thanks hey, for inviting me. How are you doing? Steve. Very well, thanks. I want to share with our audience some of your work mm -hmm. so that they can get up to scratch on sure. what we're talking about here. So, Michael, if we can, here's the graphic on the dropout rates by language. And some of this will come as a shock to some people, some not so much. Look at this 22% and change English background, almost 23% Russian. Then you go a little more for Greeks and Persians. Somali, we start to go very high. And there, Spanish and Portuguese among the highest dropout rate for grade nine. This is very, very uh, concerning, obviously, to people who are of these backgrounds, and we're going to try to figure out why this is so. Mm -hmm. Actually, the thing that wasn't on that chart that I found most fascinating, the number one group in terms of very low dropout rate, Romanians. I mm -hmm. found that amazing. Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking students had the highest dropout rates. Why are they struggling so much from these Latin American places? Uh, Steve, what we did for our study was we uh, went to the students and we asked them uh, why they thought that students were leaving school and also we asked them why are students staying. Uh, they spoke to us about four different areas of their schooling experience that were related to their decision to stay or to leave. One having to do with language. Uh, one of the primary reasons why students uh, choose to leave school is because they feel that their language needs are not met properly uh, within the context of schools. What They're, does that mean, their language uh, needs aren't met? So for instance, uh, students are tested for English proficiency, but then there aren't adequate levels of ESL. So students who are very, have very low levels of, of English proficiency are placed in very high uh, levels of courses or vice versa, because not, not all schools can provide, unfortunately the board doesn't have the resources to provide the proper levels so of English sink. support. So they sink and they leave. That's right. Okay. Uh, they, so language was one of the key uh, aspects of, of what students uh, talked about in terms of the, the barriers that they encounter. What else? The second one was that uh, we found that a lot of students talked about the need to work. Um, a lot of, some students hold full-time employment uh, at the same time that they're going to school. Um, and Say that again. They have full-time employment while they're going, while they're to, going school. to school. That's right. These are kids in their teenage years. That's right. They are, these are students at uh, high school age, some of them a little bit older, some of them as old as 20, who are still completing high school credits. Um, and they're work, some of them working full-time or part-time in, in jobs. And they to work because their parents aren't? Or because they... their parents aren't working, uh, because their parents either are, are unable to find work or have even less English proficiency than they do, and so therefore they find themselves in a situation where they have to support their parents. And we know from the board that there's a direct correlation between the amount of work that a student does outside of work, in labor, and uh, a decline in their ability to complete, to complete high school. So there's, there's a direct relationship between those two things. Uh, the third thing that they talked about is the amount of stereotypes and racism that they encountered coming from both teachers and peers. Um, and what was really interesting about what students had to say about this was the very narrow sort of set of stereotypes that, are, that they encountered um, in schools, uh, both in relationship with their teachers and their, and their peers. So they seem to always describe that people thought that if they were from Latin America, if they spoke Spanish, they must be Mexican, they must be thieves, they must be gang members, they must be drug dealers. And that was it. There were no other stereotypes. That, you got that from whom? These were the stories that the students were telling us of the stereotypes that they were encountering. But is that how they were regarded by teachers? By teachers, by peers uh, who were from hmm. uh, other, other places. Um, and what we found was that the students felt that they had very little recourse because there isn't enough presence of a, of a curriculum that would teach anyone else about any other uh, uh, versions of what it means to be from Latin America. Well, let's pick these apart a little bit because the, the three things you've described here, the language needs, the need to work, and the stereotyping, you could say those three factors about other ethnic groups as well, mm -hmm. could you not? Sure. And yet some of them, I, mean, I, I take a look at Greeks on the list, for example. Greeks are, are dropping out in half the numbers that uh, Portuguese or Spanish kids are doing. Mm -hmm. So is there something beyond that uh, in the Spanish or Portuguese communities uh, that is not a feature in the other communities, at least yes. not as much. Uh, in the case of the Spanish-speaking community, particularly uh, the community of people who come from Latin America specifically, uh, because their numbers, they, they've been coming to Canada uh, much more recently, right? They've only been coming to Canada in, in large numbers 
and relatively large numbers since the 70s. So one of the key differences, for example, with other immigrants from Europe is that when Lat people from Latin America arrive in Canada, they do not come into well-developed and very strong social networks mm. and networks of support. So for instance, uh, while they are, there's a fairly well-established uh, networks of community councils and community service groups that are specific to particular groups, uh, those groups are only beginning to emerge in relationship to Latin American uh, students. So, so we're, you know, there are very few, and the ones that are there are very strong, but there's only so much that they can do. So there aren't well-established and strong networks of support uh, that these uh, immigrants arrive into. Uh, they do not come into a system that, is, that already has resources that are specific for them. So they don't, they don't find that the board has materials for them in Spanish, for example, something as basic as ha having access to information about how to navigate the system in a language that they can understand. Okay, Ruben, let's do a little background on you, because you're from Puerto sure. Rico originally? I'm from Puerto Rico, yes. Immigrated to the United States? Yes. Uh, compared to, and finally made it to Canada when? Uh, so I came to Canada five years ago, 2006. Five years yeah, ago. Almost five years. Compared to when you did all of this many, many years ago, yeah. I guess, first to the United States, yes. how are things today, relatively speaking? Yeah. Well, I mean, the big difference for me, and, and, uh, and I think this is very, something that I keep very present in my mind, is I, I, had a, I had a very successful academic trajectory, and I was also very privileged. Uh, my father is an academic, uh, my mother is a government official and, and an activist. And so I was sort of surrounded by all of the things that would support academic success. And I went to school in Puerto Rico. So I went to high school, I did all of my K-12 education so in Puerto Rico. you were not typical. I was not your typical immigrant who arrives into a country. And I also had a fairly good level of English when I arrived into the, uh, in the U.S. when I was 17. Um, one of the really interesting differences, to go back to this question of stereotypes, is that when I, I lived in the United States for 17 years, and in the United States, because uh, community, Latin American communities have such a long-standing presence in, in the United States, you encounter stereotypes, of course, but the range of stereotypes is far greater. So in a way, it becomes easier to play around with those stereotypes, and you sort of can, can in a way, kind of take them up in a, in a different way. I was really struck by, by, what, by the narrow set of stereotypes that students were describing to us. It's not like they say, well, they have stereotypes about Salvadorians and about Mexicans and about Chileans. No, all Latin Americans must be Mexican, must be thieves, and must deal drugs. Hmm. And that was it. And I was really struck by that as a difference between my experience arriving in the United States you know, in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, and then arriving in Canada and, and, and trying to understand why that was, why, why it was such a narrow set of stereotypes. Did you ever figure out why? Well, I think it has to do a lot with the media. Uh, because the United, in the United States there is a long history of Latin Americans uh, living there, there have been a lot more opportunities, for example, for Latin Americans to assume leadership positions. There are members of the Senate who are from, from different countries in Latin America. Uh, and so uh, the source of the stereotypes and the ideas that people have about people from Latin America are not just from movies, whereas in Canada, the source of the ideas that people have about Latin America pretty much strictly come from Hollywood. Because we're, we're just so far away from that's the rest right, of Latin that's America. That's right. In gotcha. fact, people look at me funny when they say, I live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Let me read this. Here's an excerpt. Uh, Michael, let's bring this graphic up here. This is from the um, Latin America Research, Education, and Development Network, the OISI Report. Cultural identifiers. Our immigrant young people arrive in a consumerist society in which owning a cellular phone or iPod means being accepted or not by their peer group. If parents cannot provide these quote-unquote identifiers, young people scramble to find a job as soon as they're able in order to purchase these apparent necessities. Is this the basic reality of most of the kids that you talk to? You know, it, that, is, that was echoed in what the students said to us in terms of what are, what are their priorities, what is their orientation, uh, their need to find cultural markers and identifiers that uh, to some extent would sort of position them as, as, as part of a larger group of adolescents and teenagers, uh, you know, wanting those things that would in a way sort of through which they would be able to articulate an, identi an, identi an identity or an identification that wasn't just about their ethnic identity. That is true, the students did to talk about that. But what was interesting is that that was not detached from the rest of their life, and, and that their ability to access those things or their responses to them was not detached from all the other stereotypes and all the other experiences that they were having in school. So that if they were talking about, you know, yes, I want to be able to get a job and I want to be able to buy that pair of, because I want to be able to buy that pair of sneakers, mm -hmm. that wasn't detached from the fact that they were also getting a job because their parents couldn't get work. Mm -hmm. Or that wasn't detached from the fact that they wanted to succeed in school and yet they, were, they had to encounter these, these ideas about who they were that were foreign to them. Let me follow up on the home angle, though, because my hunch is that in, in those other identifiable groups that we mentioned off the top in the study, if a kid is thinking about dropping out of high school because mm -hmm. he wants to get a job, 
so that he can make some money so that he can buy that iPod mm -hmm. or that fancy pair of sneakers. The parents are going to say, not on your life. Mm -hmm. You are staying in school, you're finishing school, you're going to post-secondary, right? They have a very, and sometimes, heavy-handed role in making they sure that indeed. happens. Yes, they do. Does that happen in Latino or Latino It happens as well, and it's been really interesting since the report came out. Uh, Sometimes the knee-jerk response that the public has is the idea that it, it's, it's only up to the parents. As long as it, if the parents just supported education, they would do well. And what is really interesting, and this, this is actually really consistent with the research in the US, is that the parents of Latin American students are as supportive of their education and as committed to their educational success as any other parent. There is no difference. So you can't between, put the blame there. You cannot put the blame there. What is the key difference is that the parents who come with these, who, who are especially recent arrivals, they really don't know how to navigate the system. They don't know how to support their, their, their children in figuring out, for example, how to, how to get credit for the courses that they've already completed in their, in their previous high school years. Some of them come having almost completed high school. And then they don't know how to navigate the process of making sure that their high school years, wherever they came from, they, they receive credit for that time. And the parents don't know how to, how to navigate that, that uh, system either. Uh, and there's also a different orientation towards schooling. Uh, Latin American parents believe in schools. They believe that schools are there to provide for the children, and that is their, their prior experience. They believe that it isn't the job of the parent to be inside of the school advocating for them because they believe that schools should have the best interest of their children in mind. Well, sometimes that's not necessarily the case, particularly when resources are not available. And so there is a, there is a difference between not so much their commitment to education, but their expectations about education, that schools should be providing much more than they already than they are. Well, in which case, we need some ideas here. Absolutely. How do we get those numbers down? The Spanish and the Portuguese-speaking students, mm -hmm. how do we get the dropout rates down? Give us some ideas. So uh, we actually went to the students, and we asked them what would help them stay. And they had some really interesting ideas. One of the uh, most interesting ideas was that they wanted to have more leadership development. They wanted the, the board. What does that mean? That's one of those buzz terms. What does that mean? Yeah, so one of the very concrete things that actually has been uh, happening that students were able to offer as an example of something they want more is over the last few years, the, the Toronto District's board, ha board has been sponsoring uh, leadership camps for students where basically they're sort of three-day retreats uh, where they teach the students leadership skills, they introduce students to the structures of, of the school, how to navigate them, they teach them about how to build community action, how to identify uh, goals, how to organize around those Can goals. Can that work? Uh, that appears to be working. The students who are involved in those programs come back to school at the mm -hmm. very least. Um, one of the things, you know, we're now in the piloting phases of implementing uh, a, uh, a course that we're hoping will integrate some of these ideas. Another thing that the students talked about is they'd like to see a, a kind of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. We know that students works. Who have been, we know that works. Yeah. It, if you have students who know how to navigate the program and you empower those students to help students who are just arriving, they listen to them. They know that peers will, will be able to give them this, their resources. What about this, Ruben? We, know, we have seen in the past, in the Toronto District mm -hmm. School Board at least, uh, some di so-called disadvantaged groups mm -hmm. get their own schools. Uh, there's an, there is a, a school focused on, uh, for only Aboriginal kids. Yeah. There, are, there are a school for gay kids. There is an mm -hmm. Afrocentric right. curriculum school now that's just been created. Mm -hmm. Do we need a school of Spanish-only speaking kids? Well, that's not something the kids said they needed. Uh, huh. I'll tell you, that, I'll tell you that, that much. That was clear. In fact, no, n never. The students never said we should have our own school. Hmm. Uh, I think that probably might have to do with the fact that they're very aware that they're a, a very small proportion of the student body. They're 2% of the student body. So it probably wouldn't be enough students out there to even fill a school. Mm -hmm. However, one thing that they did insist that they needed is that they wanted more both curricular, officially cu official parts of the curriculum, as well as, as well as extracurricular activities that were group specific. They did say, we want to be able to have clubs where, the, where it's specifically about uh, uh, engaging in uh, cultural forms that we bring with us. Mm -hmm. We want to have Latin American history. We want to be able to talk about contemporary society in Latin America. We want to be able, basically what they said to us, we want to be able to counteract the stereotypes that people have about Latin America by having more curriculum, an enriched curriculum, that focus on Latin American culture. Let me fo follow up on that then for our last question here. And that is, we, OK, we understand what parents are able to do or not do. Mm -hmm. We understand what trustees can do. We understand what the students themselves can do and their peers. Let's finish on teachers. Nice. There's probably nothing worse that a teacher can do for his or her students than to have low expectations yeah. of those students based on ethnicity or something like that. How do you get, we've got tens of thousands of teachers in this province, right. how do you get them to stop looking at Spanish or Portuguese kids as somehow not worth the effort? I'm so glad you brought that up that, because actually the fourth area of the, uh, that the students spoke with us about and that 
I think suggests both the power of the teachers as well as the complexity of the relationship was that, was that students describe teachers as both being able to push them out of school or keep them in school. Right. So we had lots of stories of students telling us, I had this amazing teacher who really believed in me. This teacher didn't speak Spanish, but went out of the way to really help me try to succeed, and that's why I stayed. And they also had stories of, te of teachers who, who basically said, you know, they treated me like trash, they thought I was a thief, I, had, I wanted nothing to do with school. Mm -hmm. So the power that these teachers had, both to get the students to stay as well as to get the students to, I know, out of the system. So how do you change those attitudes? So how do you, how do you change is by uh, uh, inviting teachers to engage students for who they are, to uh, allow students the opportunity to bring their cultural backgrounds and their experiences from, from prior to coming to school to enrich their experiences in classrooms and to allow them an opportunity to really sort of manifest themselves in their cultural richness to go beyond the narrow stereotypes that some people, some teachers obviously have about them, which end up basically telling students, you don't matter. Mm -hmm. you know? So valuing what they bring with them, who they are in all of their cultural complexity. Here's hoping. I hope so. Thanks for shining the light. Ruben Gastambide Fernandez. Thank you. University of Toronto, great to meet you. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight. It's nice to be here.